Hi, everyone. I'm Angel Sampson. I'm the director of the monoclonal antibody core in the ICBR on the first floor of the Cancer and Genetics Research Complex. Um, we're hosting the talk from Gator Bio. Currently, we have a Gator Bio Prime instrument in our core facility. So if you would like to come and try out the instrument, please do. The probes are provided for free. So really, all you have to do is bring in samples. If you're unsure as what the uh, Gator Bio does, it measures biomolecular interactions between molecules so that you can measure KD values. So if you're interested in, um, in how uh, the strength of binding between an antibody and an antigen or between a molecule and RNA or DNA, um, please reach out. You can contact me uh, through email. My email is angel.samson at ufl.edu or just you know, look on the website, the ICBR website, click the monoclonal antibody icon, and, um, and that'll you know, bring up all of our emails and telephone numbers so you can contact us. So today we have um, Dr. Chip Slaybaugh. This is his second time coming. Um, he's gonna be doing a talk, just basically an overview of the different probes that we have and how the um, instrument works, and then, um, we're really happy to have Dr. Mario Misch here from the um, UF Biochemistry Molecular Biology Department. Um, he's going to be talking about how he's been using the Gator Bio to measure um, AAV kinetics um, between AAV9 and uh, different FABs, antibody FABs um, taken from human patients. So I'm going to uh, hand this over to Chip. He's doing the first part of the talk. Here you go. Right, thank you, Angel. All right, hey everyone. So my part of the talk will be giving a brief introduction on Gator Bio and how the platform works. And then I'll go into the general assays that can be done on the instrument, quantitation, kinetics, both quantitation and kinetics in the same assay, as well as epitope binning. Uh, we have some new Gator products that I would, I'm excited to talk about. And then I will give the mic to Dr. Mario, who's gonna do the AAV application that him and his team have been working on. So this is Dr. Hong Tan and Bob Zuck. This is our CEO and our CTO. Uh, these are the guys that invented the BLI technology. So. Our headquarters are in Palo Alto, California. ET Healthcare is the sister company for Gator Bio. And the mission that Hong and Bob have is they want to empower researchers by creating a more powerful, productive, and cost-effective BLI system. So Gator Bio is a bioanalytical solutions company with next generation BLI technology. Our sister company, ET Healthcare, is in the diagnostic business and uh, we have products in Asia. We have strong IP over 50 granted patents. We have really exciting plans to grow in adjacent technologies. Our headquarters are in Palo Alto, California with over 550 employees worldwide. R&D is in Palo Alto and Shanghai and we do manufacturing here in the US in Palo Alto as well as Shanghai and Suzhou in China. So in the biotherapeutics discovery pipeline, uh, Gator is being used at every aspect of this, uh, this discovery pipeline. In early discovery, people are doing antibody titer all the way through manufacturing and QC where you're running kinetic measurements. So our label-free Gator system uh, includes our robust list of biosensors and consumables. We have a Gator Prime instrument and a Gator Plus instrument and an application specific software. So this is the current portfolio for Gator Bio. Um, we have probes, protein A, protein G. These probes are for quantitation. We have your nickel NTA, the streptavidin. We also have a small molecule and peptide probe, which is a uh, highly dense streptavidin probe. Um, AVX is the pretty recent probe that we released, and we'll be talking a lot about that today. And on this table, you can also see if the probe 
can be regenerated or not. So most of our probes can be regenerated many times. And we have some more probes coming out this year. So the instrument uses biolayer interferometry. And how this works is uh, using this phenomenon that was found about 30 years ago by Professor Gowitz. And what him and his team did was they created these thin films and immobilized antibodies onto the film. When they shined light from the bottom and detected the reflection, they saw this interference pattern. So this intensity versus wavelength pattern. And then when an analyte was introduced that was binding to their immobilized antibody, they saw this shift in the interference pattern. So we're using this physics phenomenon, but on the surface of a probe. So everything's happening on the tip of this probe. So we have immobilized molecules, and in real time, as there's binding events happening, it shifts the interference pattern. So what is displayed is a change in the shift versus time. So in real time, you can see these binding events happening. So here's a video that explains what I just spoke about. So we have white light is our incident light. It shines down the probe and is reflected back parallel. So the, the detector is parallel to the incident light. And it's detecting this wave pattern. But what is being displayed is the change in the wave pattern. So this first molecule that's binding to the probe, this is what we call our ligand. So if you're running a kinetics assay, you would load a ligand and then look at the binding with an analyte. But if this was a quantitation assay, if you're looking at titer, this binding curve is, the slope is concentration dependent. So this particular experiment would be a kinetics assay. And so you load your probe and the shift of the wave pattern happens as the uh, molecules are loading to the probe. And then the probe dips into an analyte well. And so as the analyte binds to the probe, you see another shift happening. This is the association curve. So this is the associ association between the analyte and the ligand. And then if you take this complex at the end of the probe and put it into a different well, a buffer, then that analyte will fall off and you would see that as a negative shift in the interference pattern. So as the analyte is coming off, this new curve, this red curve, is the dissociation of this interaction. So the gator houses two plates. <clears throat> The black plate is just a standard 96 Griner plate. This is our sample plate. And the green plate you see here is the max plate. This is the, the plate that you add your probes. So as you see, the instrument has this tilt feature. Um, so the tilting of the sample plate gives better signal to noise ratio. But also, as you can see, you can put samples into the max plate as well. So you can fill up a 96 well, and then your max plate, if you're using regeneration, you would have two columns for the regeneration buffer and the neutralization buffer, one column for your probes, and then the other 72 wells can be samples. You can also use half area plates if volume is something that you're trying to conserve. And the Gator Plus instrument can also house the 384 well plates. So you can push those volumes down to below 80 microliters per sample. So to determine concentration on the gator, what it's looking at is the initial binding rate. So that initial binding rate is concentration dependent. So what you're doing is you would need to create a standard. So you would have known concentrations of your um, molecule of interest. And you would create this standard and Gator is going to plot the standard curve. So it's binding rate versus concentration. And then if you have unknown samples, those get measured in the same way, and that binding rate will give the concentration of your samples, and it would be plotted on your standard curve.
Now, kinetics, we spoke about a little bit before. This is typically a five-step assay. Um, could be more if you, if you have quenching steps or blocking steps. But in this example, we have our initial baseline, the loading step, so the ligand gets loaded to the probe. Then you have a quick wash step, which is in a buffer. And then you're looking at a concentration series with the analyte. So you have high to low concentration, as you see in this fourth step. And then you go into the buffer well and look at dissociation. So here's how you're getting your kinetic values. So a neat tool in the Gator software is the simulation that you can do. So you're typically looking at one-to-one -one binding in these kinetics assays. And one-to-one -one binding is a very simple exponential. Different KDs, of course, will have, um, it's the ratio between the K off and K on value. But in the software, what you can do is you set up your analyte concentration series, and then you can look at the simulation. So if you have rough ideas of what this interaction looks like, namely the K on and K off, this is the theoretical, uh, the, the th theoretical curves that your interaction should look like. Um, so for me, when I joined Gator Bio, I don't have much of a kinetics background, and KD was not something I had an intuition about. And so I played around on this, this uh, simulation tool and changed different K on K off, K off values to, to try to get an intuition on what a high or a, a um, high K on would look like, what a high K off looks like. And the other great tool about this, or how this is a great tool, is to get a nice accurate KD, your analyte concentration series is very important. If you have nanomolar interactions and your concentration series are in the thousands of nanomolar, your assay is going to look like this on the left. The concentration series is too high for that particular KD. Also, your concentration series can be too low. So your optimized concentration series, this is what you're looking for. So the simulation tool can help when you're trying to decide whether you want to start at 200 nanomolar, whether you want to do a three-fold dilution series, you can look at what the data is going to look like. So on the Gator, you can also do epitope binning. Um, we've made the software very intuitive to set up these types of assays. Uh, these two examples are four by four tandem and sandwich assays. This is the an example of an eight by eight. And on the Gator Prime, you can do a up to a 12 by 12. And the Gator Plus, using the 384 well plate, you can do a 16 by 16. But this is an example for an eight by eight. And as you see, you get your uh, stoplight type of, uh, of data, whether you're binding or not. The Gator also will give you your bins, so you can look at the epitope network. So we also have a small molecule probe. So this small molecule probe um, has been giving us phenomenal data with these very small molecules, which is, you know, it's a very hard thing to do on a BLI instrument. These molecules, the analytes that you're looking at, when you get down to below a kilodalton, you start getting a lot of noise and the, the um, binding of those small molecules is not leading to much of a shift in the interference pattern. But using these small molecule probes, we've enhanced the type of signal that you can get from these small molecules. So we have an example of a 330 Dalton interaction, and this is also a 332. So we just released this Flex SA kit. So streptavidin is a probe that cannot be regenerated. So when a biotinylated molecule loads to the streptavidin probe, that interaction cannot be reversed. So those probes cannot be regenerated. We have created this new technology. It's a streptavidin probe that can be reactivated. So you run your assay like you normally would. You have your streptavidin and your biotin interaction. 
And then at the end of the assay, you do this reactivation step that just takes a few seconds and it strips the streptavidin, reloads the streptavidin, and now you have a brand new streptavidin probe. So this is our flex assay. We've also created uh, an anti-mouse FC probe that is um, a very, very robust probe. This has been known to be a difficult probe to use. Um, the dynamic range has always been fairly small and it's not been a probe that you can regenerate. With our new anti-mouse FC, not only can you regenerate this probe over and over, but you can look at the nanogram per ml range. So the lower limit of detection we've increased and we've also increased the upper limit by a lot. So this is a, uh, I believe a five log um, probe, the dynamic range. All right, so the Gator AAVX probe. So this is another probe that we just released. So this is the only ready to use AAV quantitation probe on the market. It saves significant time and money and uncertainty. So this probe costs, it's a lot less than any other type of method that you would be using for AAV titer. Um, if you want to measure one single sample on the gator in a couple seconds or in a couple minutes, you can do that. Um, so you don't have to uh, dilute the samples. So this gator probe has a five log VP per ml uh, dynamic range. The data correlates very well with ELISA data and it's extremely cost effective. So if you're looking at quantitation with the AVX probe, in two minutes, you're running eight samples at a time and you're getting tighter for these eight samples. You can regenerate these, these probes many, many times. It captures serotypes one through 10. The dynamic range that we're seeing is 10 to the nine up to 10 to the 14. And that upper limit, we believe we can go quite a bit higher, but we just don't have samples that are above uh, E14. So. So here's a comparison of the dynamic range of some of these other applications that are doing AAV tighter. So right now we're looking at low E9 to E14 BP per ml. We're just about to release this ultra wide dynamic range that's gonna give us two more logs at the lower limit. So we're looking at ELISA type quantitation values. So if you're doing ELISAs, you know, very well what this workflow looks like. Um, whether it's one sample or a whole plate, this process is the same. You're looking at 240 minutes or so to get tighter. On the gator, whether it's eight, pro eight samples, 96, or one sample, you're setting up, running your assay, and doing the analysis in under 30 minutes. So this is what some of the tighter data looks like. Um, we have a standard curve, so this is run in duplicate, and we have E14 down to E11 on this one particular quantitation assay. We tried a bunch of different buffers. Um, we're getting tighter in pretty much any buffer we've ever tried. So if you have purified samples or very crude samples, you can get tighter with this platform. Here's some ELISA comparison data for um, four different samples. This is AAV2. So in summary, this probe is looking at capsid determination or quantitation of serotypes one through 10. We have a five log dynamic range for all serotypes or both serotypes. In 90, you can run 96 samples of titer in less than 30 minutes. Once you run this titer assay, the samples can be recovered. So we can look at purified, crude, any type of sample you can run with this AVX probe. It's stable over a broad pH range and it's very cost, cost effective. This probe can be re reused over and over for titer or kinetics. And like the Gator, and um, all the probes we have, it's plug and play, and there's very little hands-on time. 
there's no maintenance on this instrument. Um, you know, any one of you can become an expert in half a day on this instrument. All right, so thank you. That's uh, the portion of the talk that I will be doing. And now I'd like to introduce Mario. So Dr. Mario is gonna share some of the data that he's been collecting on the Gator the last couple months. Hey, hello everyone. So I should probably stay here. So I'm gonna share our experience with the Gator Bio and this is a little bit more specific towards our studies that we do on analyzing the end, uh, antibody binding of AV capsules. And before I start, I will give a short introduction on the AAVs. So the adeno-associated viruses are small, non-enveloped icosidial viruses. They are packaged um, around a 4.7 kilobase single-stranded DNA genome. And there are certain AV serotypes, and, but there are also numerous other natural isolate and even engineered capsid variant that where the sequence identity can vary between 50 to 99%. But all of these capsids share still on the capsid service uh, common features such as the channel around the 5 volt symmetry axis, um, the large protrusion around the uh, three fold symmetry axis, then we have depression at the two fold and around the five fold channel, and the race region that separates both depressions that we call the two five foot wall. Since the 1980s, AVs have been developed as gene therapy vectors, and they do the, uh, this is because they are uh, non pathogenic and they are able to package genes and you can express these in a whole range of uh, cell types. And in the last four decades, AVs have become one of the most popular um, uh, vector for in vivo gene therapies, as you can see in this pie chart from that review in 1918, uh, 2019. <laughs> and <clears throat> the early clinical trials actually when you think 15, 20 years back, was mostly using AV2 capsules as um, the capsule for the gene therapy vector. Uh, but in the last decade, the number of capsules that were used for the clinical trials actually diversified much more. And as you can see lately, there are a whole bunch of different AVs, including AV9 being used in clinical trials. And this is because the you can ut utilize the, um, the different, uh, the tissue tropism of the specific virus to target specific regions, uh, organs or tissue types uh, um, that these capsules normally target. Whereas AV2, the one that was, was used in the back has a very broad tropism. And to date, there are three approved uh, gene therapy biologics um, on the market. Uh, right now, it's actually just two because one has been taken off because it was not financially viable. And these three products were AV uh, Glibera, which is an AV1 capsid um, vector, uh, Luxtona, which is based on AV2 capsid, and then there's Sogensma, which is an AV9 vector, which, will, which I will focus a little bit more on today, which is uh, um, for a treatment of. Um, um, spinal, spinal oh, SMA type one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, however, one big hurdle for widespread application of AV vectors in gene therapy uh, uh, is the uh, pre-existing uh, pre immunities towards the capsid. And this is because most of us had uh, natural exposure to the AVs at some point and our immune system generated antibodies against the capsids. And depending on what AV serotype you're looking for, these can range between 30 and 80% in healthy adults. And if we look at this data on the left side, which is a study done in France, you can see, for example, around 50% of healthy adults had antibodies against AV9 and 
here at UF and at the Shands Hospital, they found actually around 75% of people had antibodies against AV9. And this can be very critical, especially if these antibodies are neutralizing um, antibodies. They can actually prevent your uh, vector uh, from doing what it's supposed to do, expressing your gene of interest. And if you have these antibodies, they can reduce or completely um, inhibit your therapeutic efficacy. And the way they do this, they bind to the capsid. They can, for example, prevent cellular attachment uh, to the uh, cells of interest. Or we know also antibodies that bind to the capsid that are able to enter the cells, but prevent then the downstream steps such as endosomal escape or the uncoating or the genome release. And if you look at um, clinicaltrial.gov, for example, you will always find for the different clinical trials uh, exclusion criteria. For example, um, that if you have neutralizing antibodies against the serotype of that is the one that you use in your clinical trial, you can, even though you might need that uh, treatment, you have they have to exclude you from the clinical trial. And uh, that's why our lab is focusing on characterizing uh, these AV caps of antibody interactions. And we, in our lab, we determine the antigenic region of the AV capsid using cryoelectron microscopy. And the goal is to identify the residues on the capsid surface that serve as the contact residues for these antibodies. And we want to modify uh, these uh, residues to generate new capsid variants that are capable of escaping these pre existing antibodies towards these capsid and then are capable of transducing these cells similar to the wild type in absence of antibodies. In the past, we have done a lot of these analysis using uh, mouse monoclonal antibodies. However, that faced some criticism because people said they don't really simulate the human immune response. So for this study, we're actually now uh, isolating human monoclonal antibodies. And these were derived from patients that either received the Zorgensma uh, AV biologic that I mentioned earlier, which is based on AV9, or from patients that were excluded from the clinical trial because they had already antibodies against AV9. And the way the isolation worked is that PBMCs were obtained from uh, these patients, so peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and they were uh, sorted for single uh, mammary B cells, which were cultured on fetal cells. And then the supernames were screened for antibodies in the supername that react to AV9 capsid via an ELISA. And further than uh, from the positive clones, uh, RNA was extracted to select uh, or de determine the sequences um, from the heavy and light chain using RT-PCR and sequencing, resulting then in uh, unique sequences that we are able to clone. Uh, we, uh, that we are able to clone um, to generate IgGs, FABs that can be then produced. This was a collaboration with the University of Sydney. And in our case, we are interested in use, utilizing the FABs that we can add to capsules, in our case, AV9, and then determine the structure by cryoelectron microscopy. And here you see an electron micrograph of AV9 capsule without an FAB bound. And here, hopefully it's visible you see the caps are decorated with the FABs on all sides. And then when you reconstruct the, um, those micrographs, the particles, you will see that you have extra densities now. So the red part would be then the FABs compared to the uh, AV9 caps that were built. So meanwhile, we have analyzed uh, a total of 13 of those antibodies from humans from two patients. And here again, you see an AV9 capsid without FAB 
and wherever you have these wet parts, you see the FAB bond, and this uh, bind to the threefold region, the two fivefold wall, the twofold region on fivefold. So, but one thing became very apparent from these two patients alone is that nine of the 13 antibodies all bind to the twofold region. So, which appears to be the most, uh, the antigenically most uh, uh, dominant region of the capsule. And while we were analyzing this data, the Gator Bio um, machine actually was an, uh, was an opportunity that we uh, to analyze uh, the binding efficiency of these FABs on the caps to maybe uh, find out if there's any correlation on the kinetic, on uh, how st strong an antibody binds to the region where it binds to the capsule. And for this, we use the ABX uh, probe uh, chip introduced earlier. And we have done some studies before that. And we know that the AVX nanobody that is um, uh, immobilized on these probes actually binds to a whole bunch of AV seal types around the fivefold region of the capsid. And um, so in our case, as I said, we use AV9 capsid. And in the first stage, we load the capsid. And maybe of interest can be how much of the capsid you actually need. So we use 10 to 11 capsid per milliliter in our, our, as our titer here and um, <clears throat> since we use a, a different a range of different concentration for our ligand later so we for example use eight of these wells in the 96 plates with 200 microliter each so that means you need a total of less than two milliliter of this concentration which is for us at least a, a relatively low range then in the next step we uh, associate our FABs to the capsid. And as Chip uh, mentioned earlier, you have to maybe play a little bit with the concentration that you use for the, um, for the Gator Bio machine. So for example, if you use too high concentration of your FABs, all the curves are very close together, which may maybe make the analysis a little bit more difficult. And so if you dilute it and more, the curves become better separate and um, easier to analyze than afterwards. And then the last stage, um, we uh, dissociate the FABs from the probe, and then the, the curves come down. And then there's in the program itself, these, uh, there are these abilities to analyze the sample and determine the kinetics to get your KD values or K on and K off values. And we have done the analysis of the 13 antibodies that we uh, that I introduced earlier, and this was actually done by uh, by a technician in our lab, Jane C, and or future graduate student, and she has analyzed all of these uh, 13 FABs, and we ha I have colored these here based on where they bind, and to make the analysis a little bit easier, I sorted these from the strongest binder to the weakest. Binary and weakest is relative here. So I was actually looking in the literature yesterday what, uh, what the KD of FAB, uh, antibodies are really. And it says that most antibodies have a KD in the low micromolar to nanomolar range, whereas high affinity antibodies have a KD from low nanomolar to picomolar range. So that means that probably most of our antibodies fall in a high affinity range, maybe the last two would be more like standard antibodies. And back to our question that I had earlier, is there a correlation between the binding sites and um, the affinity? For, since we have mostly uh, uh, two-fold binders, we can at least look at the affinity uh, at the two-fold region. For the other ones, we don't have too many ends at this point to really determine if there are differences uh, for the threefold region or fivefold region. But along uh, at the five, uh, twofold region, for example, we have the strongest binder, but also the weakest binder, which kind of concludes in the end, there might be no correlation of the affinity and the binding site on the capsule. Then, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we 
want to generate uh, capsid variants um, that maybe can be used then in patients that have pre existing antibodies and um, <clears throat> can then be used instead of the wider variant. So for this antibody 13, we have generate also already a variant uh, with a single amino acid substitution that appear to have a much lower binding affinity already based on just simple native amino dots. And so we use this variant also to analyze this on the gain of virus system using similar conditions for the FAB13. As you can see, um, if you compare the curves that you have here um, for 100 molar and uh, nanomolar to three nanomolar, these, all these curves go basically up. Whereas for the variant, you see with the highest concentration, something goes up, but most of these curves are um, uh, not really going much above background. So, and stays near the baseline, which kind of shows us already that this variant is severely reduced and if you compare the K on values, the new variant would be like, um, has a much weaker binding store about 100 fold then. Another application that we thought of um, is um, that we could use our F uh, antibodies that we have right now as some kind of standards. For example, we, for FAB20, where we have done some uh, our aquarium analysis already, we know that FAB20 is capable of binding 60 times to the capsules, whereas FAB27, uh, 57 binds at a twofold where it cannot bind more than once. And since they're on the capsule, they are 32 fold symmetry axis, we actually can bind a maximum of 30 FABs on each capsule. And then FAB13, um, binds at a three-fold symmetry axis, where uh, also just a single FAB is able to bind. And since there are uh, 20 three-fold symmetry axis on the capsule, we can bind a maximum of 20 FABs per capsule. And this kind of ratio is then all, we can also see if we just load the FABs on the, um, um, ch uh, on the probe to its um, FABs uh, loading saturation, and uh, or as, uh, association actually, and basically you can see for Fab 13 to Fab 57 um, that we have around 50% higher curve, which means it simulates this ratio. And how this can be used is maybe in the future if you have an unknown FAB that you want to analyze, and of course, Quarium Quarry Electric Microscopy is not the cheapest technology. So you could maybe use this FAB to um, get an educated guess, maybe how many times uh, a capsule, uh, an FAB bind to the capsule, and maybe also get an idea where it will bind on the capsule. So to summarize the data that we got from the Gator Bio, we had a, FAB, a, whole, a series of FABs uh, that, where we determined the KD values, and they range between 0.25 to 40 nanomolar. And some of our FABs are very tight binder, uh, where um, the, in the dissociation step, the curves don't come really down. Makes sometimes the, the determination a little bit uh, difficult. Maybe even have the KD will be even lower than what we determine. But overall, it's an easy way to determine the KD and relatively fast. So most of these analysis can be done in an hour or less. And we can use this for um, analyzing even our capsid variants to analyze if a new variant is really able to escape a certain antibody. And as I mentioned before, there are relatively low material requirements. So we don't need very high concentration to do these analysis. And the same on the FAB side, we don't really need high concentrations there. So I just want to acknowledge everybody that made this data, data possible. So of course, Mavis, she uh, made everything that we do possible, then uh, Rob and Paul, Jane, who did mostly uh, analysis or the actual data generation on the Gator Bio. 
and Arsenal helps with generating the escape variant for the capsules. And our cooperation partner at the University of Sydney to generate the antibodies. And I guess come to the end. Do you have any questions? Yes, we're going to uh, take some questions. Thanks, Barbara. You might have some questions in here too. So, um, anyone in the audience have any questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so, so he asked about um, antibodies being produced for the new variants, the escape variants. Yes. Um, Are you? We'll take that. So you're talking for gene therapy purpose, right? So. Yep. So the reason why we're doing that is, let's say, if you have a certain uh, gene therapy product, for example, AV9, and you have, let's say, 50% of the population uh, that cannot receive your gene therapy product because it's already, um, they have antibodies against the wild type form. So what we do is generating variants that are escapable, uh, capable of escaping these antibodies that the patient, uh, people already have, and so that we are able to use, uh, utilize our new variants that are capable uh, to be used for these patients. So if you're right, so if we, they receive this new variants, they will generate antibodies. But hopefully the goal with uh, the AV gene therapy is that it's a single treatment and already um, that you might not need a redosing. But, um, you can also generate then, of course, new variants based on the existing antibodies of uh, the antibodies that you generate in the clinical trial. Then, yes, does it make sense? There's a couple questions online, um, so I'll just kind of quickly go through the question and answer. Uh, percent CV is calculated by OD or a measured value. That so that would be the measured value that the CV is calculated by. And then Kevin also asked, is it ready for GMP use? And yes, so we just are releasing the uh, 21 uh, CFR part 11. So that is released um, as a Gator Bio product. Um, does the large size of AAV interfere with the reflection of light? Um, we're not seeing the interference from the AAV like we do with some other larger molecules like cells. Um, other lipid um, molecules, there is um, a size that you will start seeing either a negative signal or um, typically when you're looking at these lipid nanoparticles. Uh, but the AAV, we see crystal clear. Um, do any of your probes use a streptavidin base? So yeah, we have the streptavidin probe um, along with the small molecule probe. Those are both streptavidin. Um, will you be developing probe for LV? So that's a, uh, an application that we're working on right now. Um, as of now, we just have the AAVX probe, um, but we're working on that type of assay. Um, for the plate arrangement, the R and N are noted on max plate in your slide. Does it mean regeneration buffer and neutralization buffer? Yes. So the R is the regeneration buffer and the N is the neutralization buffer. The regeneration buffer is just a low pH buffer that we supply um, or the users can make. And the neutralization buffer is your assay buffer. So if you're running PBS, you would have the PBS in the neutralization wells. Uh, so do you have any experience using VLI on larger particles, 100 to 500 nanom uh, nanometers? Yes, um, so that's another assay that is, people are developing. It's been used plenty of times. Um, like I said, you may see this negative signal um, at those very large particles. 
Um, yeah, so yeah, so when you see this negative, so there's some pretty bizarre physics that's happening with this negative signal, um, but it is kinetically driven what the signal you're seeing. And when you see this negative signal, you can flip the data and fit that and get KD values. So, um, is Gator AVX probe and BLI testing been used as release test for cell and gene therapy products? Uh, I do not know the answer to that. I think so. Um, we can reach out to you and let you know if there's any publications. Um, have you analyzed stressed material and does it show differences from material handled under nominal conditions? Um, yes, yeah, so people, there are projects that people are using Gator BLI. Um, they're stressing out antibodies and other molecules and if the stress causes the molecule to not bind anymore, yeah, of course you will definitely see that. Um, if it changes the binding at all, you will see that in, in the uh, kinetics that you're looking at. So are there any more questions in the audience? Yeah, so, so Angel's asking about the regeneration. Um, so one slide does say for the AVX, does say 30 and the other does say 10. So the original number we were um, advertising was 30. Um, then we changed it to 10. I actually didn't update the slide. Uh, the CV stays extremely tight up until 10. Um, for the application like kinetics, where you're just loading AV and then looking at an analyte, for the AVX probe, you can regenerate well, well over 10 times, 30 times, maybe even 50 times, because that type of interaction is not dependent on the initial binding rate. So if, when you're looking at quantitation, if you lose binding, if the probe loses ability to bind the same way, that binding rate changes. And so when we're looking at regeneration, we say 10 times because the CV is, is great. You, the titer will look the same for at least 10 regenerations. Then the probe starts losing some of its capacity. So, yeah. Have you tested biphasic binding? Um, yeah, so I, we come across that all the time. Um, a lot of assays that people are looking at, these interactions are one-to-one, -one. Um, but sometimes like the curves, when I was showing the simulation, those were all one-to-one -one binding curves. Sometimes in a real life assay that you're running, you won't see this clean one-to-one -one curve. It won't be this exponential. You'll see what we're calling biphasic. So if there's two different types of molecules that are binding, they will have different KDs and you'll see the summation of, the signal will be the summation of those two binding events. So that would be biphasic. We have two-to-one interactions and one-to-two interactions where you would also see this biphasic behavior. Yes. Yeah, so the question was about uh, the loading time and the signal that you're looking for when you're loading and if there's a way to set some type of threshold and set up a time. Um, yeah, so in the software, when you're setting up the assay, you can, well, as you're doing it, the assay steps, you can set times, but you can also set a threshold. So for this kinetics example with the AVX, after 10 times or so, there might be a little bit of loss in the binding capacity of this probe. And if you want to continue to load to, you know, whatever optimized loading response you found. So let's say you, you want to load to 0.6 nanometers. If the first 10 assays take 120 seconds to load to that 0.6, the next 10 might take slightly longer. And so if you want to continue with a 0.6 nanometer loaded probe for those assays, 
you would set the threshold instead of time to 0.6 nanometers. And then the loading step would be not time-based, but the response-based. Good question, thank you. Um, how is Gator BLI compared to surface plasma on resonance? Um, so they're similar techniques. They, they use different physics, but people are typically looking at kinetics with um, SPR instruments. Um, there's quite a lot of differences when it comes to the actual setup and what you would need to set up these experiments. Um, but for a very large range of KDs, the SPR data that you would get would be identical to what you're getting on the BLI. Uh, but when you're looking at these extremely tight binders, the sub picomolar range of binding, that's when the BLI system cannot discern these tight binders due to the fact that you're not having this uh, fluid, this flow that you do in SPR. So there are some differences. Um, yes, we got another question. Two different sites. Yeah, so the question was about small molecules, um, looking at the interaction between another molecule and if there's a, uh, two binding sites, would you see that? If the KD is different, which it, um, two binding sites would have their own unique KD, you would see this biphasic behavior. So it would not look like that beautiful one-to-one -one simulation that you were seeing. You would see, typically if you have a very fast and a slower, K on, you would see this fast on rate, and then the the rest of the association step would be dominated by that slow. So you would see this on, and then instead of saturating or reaching a steady state, you would see this slow upward drift. Yeah, it's. I mean the. Interaction can be a lot of different things. And so it just depends, is the signal one-to-one, -one, then you're gonna see that one-to-one -one curve. If it's two-to-one or you know, if there's aggregation, you would see, we just call it biphasic. Um, the sensogram is looking biphasic, which can be the actual interaction or it could be you know, aggregation or contaminants. Uh, so we have a question about mass transfer. Is mass transfer an issue? Does your software include mass transfer correction? Um, so that is another thing that BLI and SPR differ. Uh, we don't have any flow. You know, it's a fluidics free instrument. And so some interactions, I, I, this is such a rare thing to see, but I do see some interactions that are limited by mass transport. And we do have a fitting model in the software that takes mass transport into account. So, okay, I think, yeah, we got a question, yep. Yes. Um, I don't know the list off the top of my head, we, we do, so the question was about the mouse FC probes. Uh, so yes, it binds the uh, FC region. Um, and I don't have the list off the top of my head, which isotypes it binds, but um, we also have a protein A, protein G, protein L that typically will, if the mouse FC probe is not binding these antibodies, then one of those proteins will. Yeah, so the, the question was about ordering the order of your kinetics assay. So what you're calling the ligand, what you're calling the analyte, um, and if reorienting that assay will reveal any different types of kinetics. Theoretically, no. It doesn't matter what's binding to which, um, but typically there is one orientation that's gonna yield better results. 
Um, so typically you want to load your large molecule and look at the small. Um, but also if you, it depends on the molecule. If you have an antibody, you can be loading on the FC probes that we have. If you have an analyte that has a HIST tag, you would want to load that to the anti-HIST or the nickel NTA probe that we have. Um, if you need to biotinylate a molecule, sometimes one is better than the other to biotinylate. Um, so yeah, the orientation should not change the kinetics, but when you're optimizing this, the assay, there is typically one orientation that's better than the other. Yeah. Yeah. It binds your pro, yeah. So you typically will have a biotinylated protein that you would be looking at the small molecule as the analyte. So you'd, you'd bind your protein, the, the larger of the molecules, and then you would look at the kinetics of the analyte or the small molecule binding. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, they're both streptavidin based probes but the small molecule is just a highly dense streptavidin probe. So you're loading more, and um, we, we've created this high dense, this um, highly dense streptavidin probe that doesn't lead to this blocking that I was speaking about before. Like overloading the probe can lead to this steric hindrance and avidity issues. Um, so the small molecule probe allows for much, uh, much larger loading capacity. Yeah, the biotinylation protocol can sometimes be very simple, but um, you don't want to be binding more than one biotin per molecule. And so, yeah, the molar ratio when you're doing this protocol is pretty important. All right, so if there's no more questions here, um, so thank you guys for coming. Um, my email. I can put that up on the screen again. Um, I don't I actually don't have my email here, but my email is uh, C Slaba. I'm just going to write this down here C Slaba at gatorbio.com. So feel free to reach out. There's a lot of literature that I have that I can send. Um, yeah, and I look forward to hearing from you guys. If you have any more questions, email me. And we will. Yeah, so Angel just reminded me. Um, so the Gator Prime will be in her lab at the antibody core here at UF um, for the next few weeks. So come on in, try it out. We got all the probes down there. And, um, you know, Angel's great with the Gator. Um, I'm here for support as well. So thanks again for coming. I'm going to sign off. Thanks, guys.